you're able to join us today. Um, I've spent a lot of time with Isaac over the years in a whole variety of sometimes very strange contexts. And when, when, I, when we talked earlier this week, and we've been talking on an ongoing basis about uh, really how to help small businesses uh, move forward in this time period and deal with the current crisis, and, and sort of get their hands around what the future should look like. So everything from survival to thriving in the new normal that comes after this moment. Um, Isaac had some, some really, really strong insights. And I thought those were particularly important to share both with those of you who are online right now and also with um, you know, people who will be able to watch this video or listen to this audio later on. Isaac is coming to us from Metuchen, New Jersey, where he is the uh, manager for the downtown organization. And I'll let him uh, introduce himself a little bit more properly. Um, but Isaac's been working um, on the ground with small business owners and Main Street organizations and downtown revitalization organizations for quite a while. I'm not going to say a really long time. Um, and he always, he always brings that very, um, very solid ground level understanding of what's going on. And I thought at this moment in time, that might be more valuable than ever. So Isaac, why don't you say hello and tell us a little about yourself. All right. So thanks for the intro, Della, and happy to be here with you. And um, uh, for about 20 years, I've been involved in this work, uh, going all the way back to my time in Michigan uh, as an undergraduate uh, with an interest in restoring a historic downtown, a little town called Albion and Albion College. And it's just where it all started for me. But for about the last 15 years, I've been executive director of Main Street programs on Long Island, Appalachia, and now here in Jersey. So uh, throughout that time, and you alluded to it, but I'll drive the point home, uh, I've had an opportunity to work some, with some very interesting, very innovative people, some people who would travel for hours one day, one way, just to participate in day-long planning events with me, mm -hmm. like Better Block Projects in Middlesbrough, Kentucky. Uh, and of course, I'm referring to you, Della, and your work. And uh, it's been really one of my greatest pleasures um, to have this exchange through the years and to see your work as it continues to develop and grow. And it's been a great inspiration to me and really helped to guide my thinking and my work uh, serving uh, today our 365 members. Uh, one last point I want to drive home, though is we're living in exceptional times. I think everyone realizes that, uh, but what strikes me most is how the work that us in the economic community development field have been doing all our lives is now a national, a global preoccupation. We're all trying to figure out all at once how we can serve businesses best. Um, so this, I really think, is kind of a proving ground. You know, it's a moment, you know, for us to stand up, be leaders, uh, provide the critical help and support that's needed today. Uh, and I'm happy to share all of my uh, ideas and maybe some inspiration with folks uh, to help them as they go about doing similar work. Great. Great. Well, the, the opportunity really to to move forward in that space. Um, you know, that I had a conversation yesterday with somebody talking about kind of th this evolution and she kind of straddles the brick and mortar small business and the uh, online uh, tech world. And one of the things that we talked about was that the current moment, 
with the pandemic is really accelerating a lot of the things that we've known. And you, you, you called it a global preoccupation. And I thought that was a great way to put it. I haven't heard anybody use the term preoccupation yet, but that's pretty much on the money. It's a moment where it's accelerating the awareness of things that we have known that our uh, public policy leaders have sort of known and gave lip service to, right. but then we ended up being kind of back burner. Yeah, that's important, but you know, we got this thing to deal with right now. Now this is the thing on the front burner. And what we're finding is that that's accelerating a lot of the changes a lot of the good practices, best practices, whether for a business or for an organization, that a lot of the things that we we knew we should be doing are now have tos, must dos. And in some cases we're scrabbling to figure out ways to do that properly in a, a fast changing environment. <laughs> and that's Scooter over there who's being... When the dog's barking, you've made a good point, Bella. Or a squirrel <laughs> just ran by. <laughs> Me, squirrel, it's like basically the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, that That is one thing I love about doing the, you know, in this context is it, it's so much more humanizing. Right, you know, right. it's annoying when you have to like, you know, manage the dog. But yeah, so be it. We're, we're, we're amused by you. Okay, Isaac? I got gotcha. you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So you you laid out to me in uh, a message the other day, five points that you were, were thinking about as kind of key groundwork for moving forward and for addressing the current moment. And you described a second ago that you work with, you've got 365 businesses in Metuchen, New Jersey. Did I say that correctly this time? Yeah, you got it. Well, I got it. It only took me like years. Um, tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit about who those businesses are, kind of what that distribution looks like. Um, sort of sort of paint us a picture of what of what's in the community pre-pandemic. Sure. I uh, appreciate that setup. Um, so we're a transit village. Uh, we're about an hour outside of New York City on the main line between New York and Philadelphia. Um, four years ago, we had close to 20% vacancy rate. Um, and that was just as local leaders were coming together to put together a Main Street program and also a business improvement district. So that funding mechanism uh, to support our grassroots and volunteer driven work uh, to revitalize the downtown. At the time, it was about 656,000 square feet. It's since grown to 1.4 million. Uh, we have over 400 apartments that were built in the heart of our downtown, uh, newly activated public spaces. But most significantly, we, we went from um, having that 20% vacancy uh, to less than three as of a month ago. Um, so that was the trajectory we were on. Um, but certainly, you know, since the pandemic uh, has dominated all things, uh, our time, attention, uh, whatever else, that it's almost as if we're back in that four years ago moment uh, yeah. where we're having to rebuild uh, the town all over again. So oh um, with, with the one exception that, you know, we do have the benefit of the four years of experience uh, with building those rich networks between the businesses and uh, having some programs in place and some experience already. We gave out over $140,000 in matching grants uh, for marketing, technology, storefront renovations, et cetera, in the last two years alone. Um, so I'd like to think because of that, we're in a privileged position uh, to serve our businesses now. What kind of business are you in your community? Yeah, I gave you that classic half answer, didn't I? Um, so it, it, it's a nice mix, about 45% uh, about retail and service, uh, and then with a significant number of office-based businesses too. Um, so, uh, among the retail and service we had at the peak of 30 restaurants in our downtown, um, you know, we'll see how that continues to play out in the weeks and months ahead. Um, and a lot of personal service fitness, uh, was a big sector for us. Um, some family daycare, uh, family friendly oriented businesses. Um, so, you know, we're trying, uh, 
also a lot of convenience-based businesses, you know, from the markets to the dry cleaners um, and uh, Whole Foods Anchor uh, as well. Um, so uh, pretty diverse, uh, pretty vibrant uh, downtown, a very active arts community, I should add that, um, you know, with some things always happening, including our own public art program with the Downtown Alliance over the last few years that did some major initiatives uh, working with artists from the local to the international scale. Which is, which is a mix, but it also indicates that you've got a lot of sectors that have been very deeply impacted right. by the current situation. And, you know, New Jersey um, had to very aggressively uh, shut down um, right. relatively early. So I'm in Ohio. I think we hit it a little bit, at least in terms of the the public policy impacts and the businesses being closed and the like. I think we hit it a skosh earlier than you guys did, but not by much. And obviously, you uh, you've had a, a much more intensive. You've had to have, unfortunately, a much more intensive reaction. Um, given that mix of businesses, and given the you know the 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 variety of of environments that you're and, and and folks that you've got in your community one of the first things that you said which is i think is self-evident but sometimes people especially if they're not coming out of the main street background which emphasizes this people don't even realize that this is something that you can go do and you said ask businesses what help they need most so can right. you tell me about how you've been doing that? Um, it's been almost constant outreach for the last month. Um, when I could go door to door, I did. Um, mm -hmm. And I took with me a simple survey. And I asked about six questions, no more than that. Uh, but it was things like, have you contacted your bank to get a line of credit? Um, are you considering applying for an emergency loan? Um, are you concerned that your utilities are going to be cut out? Uh, is there anything else that we need to know that we can do to help? Um, and with those prompts that guided people through the process of, oh, this is what I need to be thinking about. This is what I need to be applying for. And then it left it open to do some empathetic listening. Um, and people shared, you know, where they were at, you know, their fears, but also their needs. Uh, you know, so, for instance, a discussion I had yesterday. Um, you know, one of our businesses, pretty soon their supply chain is going to be exhausted. So right away, you know, that was a call to action uh, for me to connect them with some other people that we know uh, to try to make sure that they can continue uh, to provide their very valuable products uh, and services throughout this. So, um, and I could easily give you 50 more examples just like that, you know, that have come out of this listening. Of course, you know, once we were stay at home, um, that we didn't have the option to go door to door. Uh, so it became all uh, phone based and virtual, uh, reaching out to businesses and keeping in touch with them. Uh, so every day I try to call a minimum of 10 businesses uh, to continue to have these interactions. I keep using the survey and benchmarking tool. Uh, so I have some good data over time uh, to oh, see how things are changing in the district. Um, and, you know, constantly I'm turning to the businesses uh, to form my own knowledge and understanding uh, of the rapidly evolving and changing conditions on the ground. Excellent. So you haven't had an opportunity to start uh, compiling any of that benchmark information yet, have you? I have, actually. Um, and I'm also part of a network with Eric Canada, with Blaine Canada, uh, that's doing some survey work nationally and I guess globally uh, to an extent. And they have a wonderful uh, BRE call every Thursday afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been sharing a lot of my information with them, including uh, some of the tips to help small businesses pivot. Uh, so the last two calls uh, that work's been featured there. And I have to give a shout out, shout out to Eric uh, because like you, uh, he's been one of the guiding stars for me uh, with this work. Good. Yeah, Eric's a fabulous guy. Um, you, you're doing all of these calls yourself, right? You Up have till today. Um, so, but I know where you're going, so I'll let you drive it home. <laughs> okay. Um, you're doing all this yourself. You're a Main Street organization, so Main Street's typically 
rely on a very small amount of professional staff and a lot of volunteers. Right. So what you're telling me is that you're now able to engage some of your volunteers in this engagement? Right. So as a Main Street program, unlike, you know, maybe some of the bids out there that are more staff driven, as a Main Street program, we pride ourselves on being a single staff member uh, with about 140 volunteers. Um, and I'd say of that 140, probably about a dozen of them are real most active, most engaged um, that I'm regularly working with and coordinating efforts with. So, um, but as of this morning, the model that we're embracing, and I have to give a hat tip to Alana with Recast City on this, is we're mobilizing a series, and she might be on the call. If she is, I'd love to hear from her. Um, we're mobilizing a series of connectors um, who are each responsible for reaching out to 10 businesses a piece. Um, and in that way, um, we can have uh, multiple people out there in regular touch with the businesses. And it's also a way for us to get to the harder to reach businesses um, so that no one feels alone, no one feels stranded, that they're all connected to someone um, and to a system. And we'll get into this as we go a little further, but a system where we can get to the resources to where they're needed most. Are you able to, who, who are these volunteers? Are they other small business owners? Are they community members? Where is this kind of core group coming from? Right, I mean, we'll take anyone we can get. Uh, one of the unique advantages we have is that uh, being in the uh, New York uh, kind of Philadelphia corridor, uh, we have a high concentration of professionals. Uh, we had a growing number of work at home professionals. Um, so, you know, my core group includes people who work on Wall Street or for some big banks uh, in other places. And uh, now we have an opportunity to take some of those skills and apply them to the needs of small businesses uh, here. Um, but, you know, I've worked with schools and students, um, uh, other creative types, um, you know, and, and really, I think the critical thing is, you know, with a connector role, we're looking for people who have those bonds and those relationships of trust already with businesses uh, who can get through to them uh, and be able to communicate in a very authentic uh, way um, so that they can be in a position to help that business uh, when that opportunity comes up. The absolute worst thing you can do in this line of work uh, is to be an unknown outsider, come into a business and say, I'm here to help. Um, you know, you have to have that existing relationship before uh, you come with the resources. Um, otherwise, you know, you'll get turned down nine times out of ten and it just, you'll be spinning your wheels and it's a waste of time. Excellent. I'm so glad you brought that up. Because I think for a lot of organizations, especially ones that are more staff driven and ones that are more, that, that have been focused more on other elements of community and economic development and haven't built those local relationships, that's a really, really crucial piece. And I love the fact that you described your connectors, this kind of core group of volunteers, as being people who already had some existing relationships. Right. Um, and, and if you're talking about people who are perhaps working from home but typically work for big banks, then you're talking about customers of these these local businesses. Is that a, a fair assessment? Oh, yeah. I mean, you back up what you love with your dollars. So, And we have those relationships, you know, now over four years, some that go much longer, you know, where we're all advocates and supporters and local shoppers, you know, who are looking out for the businesses on Main Street. And another another way to put what you're you're doing and what you know the Main Street is is a big strength of the Main Street approach is that working the network the community right. network. So you know some communities that I know that are not Main Streets are are one of the big concerns right now is with. Um, businesses that are owned by people of color, businesses that are particularly owned by African-American, Latino, um, immigrant communities, Native American owners who don't have formal relationships with banking, have little personal wealth to fall back on, or right. family wealth, and, and yet also have had very negative experiences in the past with the I'm here to help you folks, especially yeah. when they like, you know, me. Um, 
so so that in the crucial importance of of having that network and in sending from that network finding and engaging the people who can be trusted partners to those businesses i think is absolutely crucial and so i'm i'm really glad that you you know that you articulated that in this context you know, and I think, Della, one of the great traps and hazards that we all have to be aware of is kind of this hero syndrome that in this field, you know, there's a tendency to want to be that one who comes and solves all the problems and saves the people, saves the businesses and makes all things better. You know, but the reality is not one of us, you know, has all the knowledge, skills, experience, relationships, trust that's needed to help even a single business. You know, so in a way, it's going to require a massive mobilization of many people coming together to give exactly what is needed, where it is needed, to help that business get from where they're at to the next step, wherever they're going. So, and we have to throw away a lot of the garbage of, uh, I'm here to save, I'm here to, you know, give you the silver bullet. Um, this is not a sales pitch. You know, this is not a program. You know, this is the most authentic, genuine, one-on-one -on -one communication where I listen and hear what you're dealing with, run that through all the things that maybe I know I've experienced, um, and then try to give back something that'll just help you take the next step. And if I had to drive it home, you know, the most important question I ask is this, what are you doing next? Because that's the setup, you know, for them to take a step back, think, and then share. And it's the opening so we can stop talking and empathetically listen. Um, and what people share when you ask that question, what are you doing next? You'd be amazed. Mm. Um, and I really encourage people in your one-on-ones and your outreach uh, to make that one of your stock questions that you ask. What are you going to do? That's awesome. The um, I, I I don't want to belabor because you had five things that that you laid out to me that were were excellent and I want to make sure we hit those, um, but I I just want to to poke into that piece a little bit more when because one of the things that I know I've been hearing from a lot of community is that. And, and I think they're starting to come out of this now a little bit, that this has sort of become the new normal for all of us, is that there's a lot of just kind of like deer in the headlights. Um, right. And a lot of times the initial reaction, at least, you know, a week ago, two weeks ago, was what are you going to do next? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. What are you hearing um, now? What, what's, what's kind of the trend, not specific programs or specific activities, but what are you hearing now in terms of like how people are, are thinking about what I'm going to do next? So I'd say the businesses that have the best chance of survival are the ones that are innovating rapidly uh, on the fly and finding out ways to get dollars to their door. Um, so with my work and the networks that I operate in, um, I pulled together about four dozen different kind of pivots, um, and I break them down into about four categories. Um, so the first core category, uh, and I think properly so, is health and safety. Um, you know, what can you do in your business to create a safe environment for customers? limiting the number of customers in, cleaning and sanitizing, curbside delivery. And by the way, we have a very active curbside program here in Metuchen. Um, and, uh, and addressing those concerns, you know, because for some of the businesses, that's right, for some of the businesses that can stay open, uh, that we wanna help them keep open as long as they can and make sure that they're not contributing to the spread uh, of the virus. So. Um, but then quickly it becomes, you know, coming up with new distribution channels um, and a lot of focus on technology with this. So examples of like yoga studios doing classes online and taking um, people setting up online stores. If they didn't have them already, setting them up today. Um, and uh, some of these crowdfunding campaigns, we've raised about $12,000 through a Feeding the Frontlines campaign, 
um, where we buy food from local restaurants and then take it to first responders, uh, to our fire, our police, our EMS, our, um, our hospitals. Um, there's even a shelter uh, that some of the food's going to now. Uh, and it's been amazing uh, to see that program and the support that it's gotten. So, right. um, so, and then that gets to the last piece, uh, actually the third piece, which is cash flow. Uh, you know, anything that gets those dollars in the door. Uh, and then finally, the last piece, which is long-term planning, that some businesses are beginning to do the scenario planning that's necessary. Uh, if this lasts for three months, six months, uh, to figure out where the red line is, you know, how long can they go? Um, and what other critical changes they need to make to their business if they're going to have a chance uh, to make it through those different scenarios. Um, and we're actively encouraging businesses, small businesses, uh, to do that scenario planning today. Good. <laughs> One of the things we're also hearing is that there is a likelihood that, um, so specifically with the, the virus, that it's likely that there will be subsequent waves so right. we may not have everything shut down. There may be a period of time where um, Southwestern Ohio, where I am, goes through uh, a version of what we're going through now for a while, but New Jersey right. may be fine. And then that may shift over time. So right. from that standpoint, that, that long-term planning, I mean, yeah, that's unbelievably crucial. And I'm glad you're starting to get people thinking in that context you know it's it's hierarchy of needs right so at first they're trying to figure out how to survive then they're trying to to figure out how to keep going for the long term um the other thing with that that plays into that and you know in 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 new jersey you're occasionally subject to hurricanes um in my neck of the woods we predominantly see issues like tornadoes but disaster recovery and disaster coming bringing your business back after a disaster um, I don't have a source for this yet but I was told the other day that on average 40% of small businesses close after any kind of disaster whether right. it's like this or it's a hurricane Sandy or it's a uh, Xenia tornado in my neck of the woods um, and that's obviously humongously problematic. So the ability to sort of learn from the experience and build in resistant resilience rather going forward is is crucial. So I'm really glad. Well, let's drive it home. Let's drive that home. So uh, what we knew before the crisis is that small businesses were persistently uh, underfunded. Um, so it really should be no surprise at all uh, when $350 billion becomes available that it's gone in two weeks. Um, it's because we have fundamentally not funded small businesses at the level or scale that's needed for them to be exactly that, resilient. Um, so, um, so it's a very interesting, and interesting doesn't really give it justice, uh, but it's, it's like the biggest social and economic experiment maybe ever conducted. Um, mm. We're taking an underfunded sector, we're pumping $350 billion into it and a lot more beyond that. And now we're going to see what happens. So, um, and I have my predictions, other people's out there have theirs too. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my silver lining, my hope is that the innovation that's happening today will accelerate that small amount of capital that gets out there. Some will be wasted, you know, just lost forever. Um, but some will be put to good use and we're going to see a wave of entrepreneurship and small business vibrancy uh, is a result of what we're going through right now. It's going to have ripple effects decades into the future. That's my hope. We can hope. It definitely sounds like a good strategy. But let me ask you, Isaac, you know, you're, you're talking about this, you know, $350 billion and, and, you know, potential for additional and certainly at the federal and the local level and all of that kind of thing. But you called this an underfunded sector. Aren't they supposed to fund themselves? Aren't they supposed to... Um, your, your Ohio you know, roots are betraying even, you, Tella. I, uh, I, what? Your Ohio roots. Your uh, <laughs> Midwestern... Conservative. Pull, up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps uh, ethos. And as a Michigander, I, I empathize with you, even though I completely disagree. 
Um, so, you know, the average small business has reserves to last them 26 days. You know, that should be frightening in and of itself. Uh, some have less, many have less, restaurants have less. Many have less. Um, you know, the fact that one in 10 jobs in America are restaurants, one in 10 are retail, and these sectors are getting pounded right now, um, should be a moment for pause for all of us. So, um, and where were the people five years ago that were talking about the necessity of small businesses to get lines of credit, uh, to build prudent reserves? Who was talking in those terms? Some people were, maybe our friends with SCORE and the SBDCs and others, you know, gave that sound advice, but who was doing it? But more importantly, from this point forward, think of now kind of as an inflection point, from this point forward, who's giving that advice to businesses today? You know, you should have a reserve, you know, that's going to help you for disruptions that could last anywhere from six to 12 months. Um, that would seem to be this new generation of thinking and advice that needs to start going out. Um, but most importantly is this, we're in the business of wealth creation. Um, and it's not acceptable for half of small businesses in America to fail in their first three years, five years of being open. It's completely unacceptable in the first 10 years that 70% of them fail. We have an opportunity today to change that whole dynamic and to give small businesses a fighting chance to be the real engine of wealth creation for our communities, but really for our country and really throughout the world, right? Um, if we're going to be resilient, it's going to be on the backs of these 50% of Americans who work in small businesses. And we need to be doing everything we can to get resources into their hands uh, to get them through this and to end up on the other side stronger and better prepared uh, to do whatever it is they need to do to make it. Excellent. Excellent. We talked about asking for help. We talked about that connecting process. Is there anything else you want to you want to say along the lines of the 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 process of connecting businesses? Because then I want to get to we've we've talked about I want to talk about technical assistance and then I want to talk about um, funding and financing uh, to wrap it up. So I'm kind of reorganizing your your points. Um, how about connection? We've talked about connection. Um, is there are you finding unexpected um, partners in this process? Are you are, are you finding that you're working with people that maybe you haven't had the 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 opportunity or really the awareness to work with in the past? Right, right. You know, I'm at the school. A crisis brings out the best in people, and uh, that's been my experience. So, um, I think you know any of the squabbles or turf issues that might have characterized things before the crisis, none of that matters now. Mm. You know, we are literally in the fight of our lives to help people and businesses survive. Um, and I think it's a rallying call uh, to bring people together across organizational boundaries, jurisdicts, jurisdictions, um, even across states. You know, it's amazing to me to see the kind of regional collaboration happening among the governors, you know, to talk about mm -hmm how we're going to reopen the economy. So um, so I think it's an unprecedented moment of collaboration. Um, and I think the smart leaders are the ones that reach out, you know, get these partnerships going. If they weren't already, get them going um, and make a really big tent uh, because we're gonna need all hands. And like I said before, no one has all the tools uh, that are needed. You know, it's like uh, we're all blind and we have a 800 pound elephant in front of us and you're holding a, trunk, you know, another guy's holding a tail, someone's holding a leg, you know, but none of us know that it's an elephant, except by sharing our experience together. So, so we're in this experience of feeling the elephant right now. And um, we really need everyone uh, to pitch in, uh, to create some value, and do whatever we can to help businesses out. Well said. Well said. Um, Let's talk for a minute about technical planning. So, so you laid out your four dozen pivots, the, the classifications of those four dozen pivots. And if you've got that in a 
sort of sort of um, formulated fashion. I'd love yep. to be able to share that with folks. Um, I'm sure. really happy to do that. And I'm curious as hell to see what all you've got in there to begin with. Um, but I, I think a part of what's fabulous in having both those those four categories that you described before, health and safety, new distribution networks, cash flow and long term planning is that it's a basic framework that people who are overwhelmed and right. scared and things can get their heads around. But then I'm presuming within those there's very, very concrete base, concrete um, steps that people can take which is right. again, really helpful when people are going like, Oh my God, what do I, what do I do? What do I do? And I, I feel like sometimes people in um, particularly people who are in positions like yours, um, certainly I'm feeling this for myself. We just end up, you know, regurgitating this swarm of information. That's, that's right. That just makes it worse. Right. Right. You know, catch package and push out. You know, that's the business we have to be in. And, um, you know, there's there's a lot out there. Uh, the one advantage I have is 15 years ago, I was a FEMA contractor on the Gulf Coast. Uh, and then all that experience working in downtowns, various places throughout the country, helping them to survive. Um, I, I don't want to appeal to ego, but, you know, a number of times throughout this, I felt, you know, something about my background and training prepared me for this moment. Um, and I think one of the most important things I can share with you is this, that um, yes, we need to be leaders to our local community, uh, but we need to have one foot in our local community and one foot in the world. Um, because we're involved in this kind of mass online learning environment right now, um, where all the great ideas are out there. Um, we just need to catch them. Um, and by the way, if we have some innovations locally, which are relevant, uh, we need to push those out and share them with others. So, and one of the best people who's done this, and I have to give a hat tip to my friend, uh, is Kennedy Smith. Um, her work with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, she was one of the first people out of the gate um, to formalize some of these ideas. Yeah. And when I share the document with you, you'll see that she cited many times over um, you know, as being one of those thought leaders, you know, who's captured a lot and is helping uh, to push the right information out to small businesses who need it most. Yeah. And with my work with Amoeba, we've been partnering with ISLR um, pretty closely. And it's been, it's been very, very effective. I um, mean, Kennedy I think, came into that role right about the time that I came into this role with Amoeba. And uh, her, her her perception and her just her ability, her reach um, is is uh, incredibly valuable. Right. Scooter, Scooter has, agrees with you, by the way. Yeah, Scooter has much to say on this topic. Um, it has nothing to do with the dog walking us over here, boy. <laughs> well, I lost my dog in November, so you know I am happy to see and hear little little Mr. Scooter. Um, I got you. He's small, but mighty. He's small what? Small, but mighty. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a very, uh, just some of, some of us, you know, qualify for the, at least the small part as well. Gotcha. Um, and mighty. Yeah. You should go reread one of your books, Stella. That's what I, I did this morning to get ready. Oh, bless you. All right. Yeah. I, um, it's amazing I, what a crisis does to change the whole meaning of the works that we made before it when yeah. we're in the middle and afterwards. Yeah. So, and frankly, the local economy revolution may be the single best book for people to pick up and read today. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I will, will you know, cut you your check later. Um, no check needed. Understood. No, you've, you've been you know, you were a great and early supporter of what I was trying to figure out how to say. And even back when I was still even more so than today, fumbling around with trying to figure out how to say it. I think you know this, I'm actually in the process of trying, I well, before the pandemic and, you know, everything got crazy. Um, I've been in the process of trying to revise and update that local economy book. But, right. um, I'm really glad that that you've found the local economy revolution to be useful. And 
I'll, I wasn't going to do this, but I'll post a link to the book on here. And uh, yeah. well, when you do that, you better put up Everybody Innovates Here uh, because that book is also, it's almost like a, uh, I'd want to say a trilogy, but what would two together be? Uh, you you have to read yeah, them together. So, I don't know. Um, and particularly the conclusion of Everybody Innovates Here that, um, you know, that's essential reading for right now. Awesome. I will make a note to uh, plug myself. Oh, up. by the way, the yeah. treatment of nonprofits and everybody innovates here uh, was slightly prophetic. So uh, <laughs> definitely reread that too. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, let's let's spend a couple of minutes. We we've we've been talking for a while, and you've got plenty of other things to do today. And Scooter, you know, Scooter needs a little love and attention here. There are many squirrels to run after. So. <laughs> Let's That's great. Point. Yes. Um, so let's let's talk about the uh, the the two of the the five points that you laid out were staying up to date on the stimulus packages, which right. you know has been a challenge in and of itself, and has certainly had benefits and limitations. And secondly, uh, finding additional financial help. So as we as we sort of round this out, let's talk about uh, those two pieces together. So obviously, I think a lot of people, excuse me, by this point know that the stimulus package was uh, much more limited um, in its delivery. You know, it's kind of in the execution of it, um, there have been failures. There have been limitations on the whole the whole range of the situation from the um the, the 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 ordinance the legislation the rules of execution to how the banks have been able or not able to move this through effectively um and there's a, a expected to be another one coming but you know there's political usually the political kerfuffles are uh um running strong at the moment um what are what are your thoughts on the uh the previous stimulus package and the um the potential future coming forward you know it's uh, always difficult to weigh into these wade into these waters uh yeah. because they can be treacherous quickly especially when you're a local leader um so you know what i reflect back is that what was provided, um, we probably needed 10 times that amount mm. to have a meaningful impact. Um, and frankly, the time that we wasted, um, we're literally going to see likely hundreds of thousands of small businesses close for good. Um, the time we're spending even now, businesses are closing. Yep. Um, so, you know, the smartest thing we probably could have, should have done um, is get $50,000 in cash grants to every business, simple, quick, and easy right away. We might have had a chance if we could have pulled that off, mm -hmm. but we didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and instead, what we're seeing is the people who need the resources most have largely missed out. Um, and the geographic spread um, that we see some parts of the country have done quite well, you know, upwards of 60 or 70% of the workforce uh, and of the qualifying businesses receiving funding, uh, but others on the coasts like us in New Jersey, the folks out in California and elsewhere, we're looking at rates in the 20 to 30 percent range. Um, so the geographic distribution and spread of these resources is unequal, um, and it's not getting to the places where it's needed most. Um, and frankly, what concerns me most is that the time we spent uh, learning the theology of the various stimulus programs and the who's and wherefores um, was also wasted um, because that time could have been spent mobilizing the local leaders and the local resources to address and provide for the immediate needs that are even greater today. Um, so, um, so we tried, you know, to push out the message about the stimulus to our members, um, but it wasn't the only string we were playing. Um, because there needs to be a comprehensive and an integrated approach of how you're going to get resources into businesses now. Um, so, um, 
So it'll be interesting to see how the next one rolls out. I think the latest, the 600 billion Main Street Fund, uh, it'll qualify for businesses up to 10,000 employees uh, in something like 2.5, what did I read? Some obscenely high uh, amount of revenue. So, um, so, and is that the kind of resources that's gonna help You know, most of the businesses on Main Street? Yeah. Maybe, but we'll see. It's, it's much more, you know, what, what several organizations have been advocating for is to specifically target businesses that are 20 employees or less. And instead, right. you know, we get these proposals that basically use the Small Business Administration definition of a, uh, a small business and counting right. that a thousand employees. Right. But when you look and at now 10,000 other peers. So, yeah. We'll and when see. You, when you look at the distribution of employment in the U.S., the overwhelming majority of employment is provided by businesses with three, five, 10, 15 employees. And that's that's your one in 10 in retail or um, in restaurants, rather. It's your one in 10 in, uh, yeah, in, re in retail. I'm looking at your notes from what, my notes from what you said earlier. Um, and, the, and those are largely left out in this process. Right. What are you, you, you also alluded to some things that you're doing in terms of local funding. So let's, let's, uh, let's hit this. And then if anybody has any questions of the folks who are online, um, feel free to put them into the chat and we'll, we'll try to answer some of those. Um, but before we do that, Tell me a little bit about what we're seeing going on locally, either in Metuchen or in other communities in terms of pulling together um, some more targeted and faster moving resources. As right. somebody said to me the other day, only the feds can print money, but right. um, there's still often things that we can do locally. Well, the first dollars we're pushing out are through our Feeding the Frontlines initiative. Um, and because uh, it's been tricky, uh, to get our financial systems and all of that uh, operating kind of status quo. You know, we have a check, you know, sign it twice and then it goes out. Um, we've actually adopted the Venmo platform uh, to pay businesses directly. Um, and through that, you know, we've gotten, we're on our way to get our first $10,000 out. Um, so it's money in the cash registers of businesses to help them today. Um, you know, this bigger picture of additional local regional resources, um, in New Jersey, we're very fortunate uh, to have the Economic Development Authority here, uh, the NJEDA, uh, which started with a $40 million program. It's up to $75 million program. They had $5,000 grants uh, that went directly to small businesses in four different, uh, maybe six different NAICS codes. Um, but they're your mom and pop shops to retail Main Street. Um, that program was fully subscribed in less than three hours after launching uh, two weeks ago because of a coordinated outreach here in Metuchen, uh, easily a dozen or more of our businesses qualified and received that funding. So, um, so there's some good state resources. I think we have to look to the philanthropic. We have to look to the crowdfunding, and I mentioned our early success with that. Um, but, you know, what I see happening um, that's most encouraging our development of regional approaches and strategies around economic development um, and seeing some of the bigger players come together uh, with the foundations, uh, with some of the public private entities, nonprofits like ours. And you see it in regions like Harrisonburg, Virginia, uh, mm -hmm. or Great Falls, Montana. Yeah. Um, and just really savvy economic developers, community development folks coming together and getting that pipeline of resources set up. Um, so that we can get it into the pockets of our businesses on Main Street. Uh, and I think those are the most encouraging efforts in this time of struggle. Excellent. And I have, I have to say, those two cities that you named, Harrisburg and, and uh, Great, Great Falls is a regional initiative. Um, right. But, yeah, you, you, if we want to look at how to take the things that we've done conventionally and really make them work, for the local entities, I would definitely encourage people to look at, in addition to Metuchen, Harrisburg and uh, Great Falls, Montana, 
you know, those are those are some of the best. Um, Covington, Kentucky, and right. my neck of the woods is another one that I'd encourage people to take a close look at what they're doing. Um, any other bright stars uh, shining your you firm? Know, I, I really think you know the list does need to be put together. The regional approaches um, and documenting each one and kind of tracking their success over time. Um, so I'm keeping my eyes on a number of them. Uh, another one's Long Beach, California. Um, their city economic development folks came together quickly, uh, developed some mechanisms uh, to get the assistance uh, out to businesses, and they're actually getting additional funding to build up their capacity so they can serve more businesses. So um, just a really smart kind of savvy approach. Um, and there's plenty of examples out there. Um, but one of my predictions is we're going to see a consolidation in the field of economic development and community development to an extent. And we're going to see some larger regional entities, uh, which then marry up with some of these bigger state uh, efforts and even these coalition of states. Um, so I think what we're going to see is a nationwide mobilization of people and resources in support of community and economic development, which we frankly have not seen uh, in this country, maybe since uh, the end of the Second World War. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, we're really in the starting uh, the first few steps of a process which, you know, it's going to lead out and have ramifications uh, that shape our life and culture uh, for years and decades to follow. Uh, and today uh, it begins. Yeah. And and I think that's a particularly interesting, you know, the, the, the sea change that conventional economic development organizations are going through right now um, right. with regard to these issues is, yeah, I, I it's been a change it, again it's an acceleration it's these are changes that have been sort of in process and unfolding and and unrolling and have been on the back burner but sometimes have been developing whether we will them to or not personally and now those are pushed to the fore more than ever so right the time for innovation is now time for innovation the time to adapt and uh, I, I have this habit of saying, go get them. So um, that was my grandma Kramer's call to action for me when I was 10 years old. She'd always end our conversations with Isaac, go get them. So, really? Uh, picture an Irish Catholic grandma from Michigan that uh, <laughs> she, it's the least thing that you'd expect, but that was her wisdom from her life, you know, which spans, frankly, to the years before the Great Depression yeah. and through all of that. And the, the other echo that I get quite a lot right now is of my grandpa Huxtable on my mom's side and his experience of getting through the Depression, uh, but also uh, how he valued the smallest of things. Um, and, uh, you know, we really need an ethic um, to get through these times as well, uh, where every dollar, every resource, every person is precious. Um, and if that kind of caring ethic emerges as a result of it, it'll be one of the greatest gifts uh, that we can get uh, from the tragedy that we're experiencing today. There's, there's no word to follow that one. Isaac, thank you so much for spending this time with me and with the folks who've been watching. Thank you for allowing me to share this with other folks who'll be watching later. I'll make sure that links to the things that you've mentioned um, are, are uh, accompany uh, the video and the audio of, of this presentation. And as always, I'm, I'm just incredibly grateful for, for your insight and also for your dedication and your determination. Um, you, Admiration you is mutual. And most of my best ideas, Della, are either yours or Kennedy's or Alana's or someone else's out there. So I just try to capture them and then share them with other folks. So keep well, doing the important work. And uh, I have a feeling we're all going to come together and be working together before this is all, all said and done. Amen and amen. All right. You take care. Yep. All right. And, and it'll be fun to check in with you on another one of these broadcasts to um, learn a little more about what you're seeing. You got it. Not a threat. It's a promise. All righty. We'll go with that. Yeah. All right. Take care, Isaac. It's preeminently the time to speak the truth frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions.
conditions in our country today, this great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert...